Welcome to the webinar. You are here for Jumpstart, continuous improvement in your manufacturing business. You will learn how to more easily achieve your business transformation goals using the proven leverage points methodology. Now, before we begin, just a few issues of housekeeping. One is that we welcome your questions. However, we will hold them until the end when we have a Q&A session. So today's webinar is brought to you by the New York Manufacturing Extension Partnership, NYMEP, helps small and mid-sized manufacturers to become more competitive. NYMEP is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Now here in New York, there are 10 regional MEP centers in one statewide center, and the entire program is administered by NYSTAR, which is the Division of Science, Technology, and Innovation within Empire State Development, the state's largest economic development agency. Now at the bottom of your slide, you'll notice a couple of logos. Fuse Hub on the left. Fuse Hub is the statewide MEP center, and the Center for Economic Growth, or CEG, is the MEP center for the capital region. So what does FuseHub and the MEP system have to do with today's webinar? Well, FuseHub provides New York State manufacturers with guided access to an extensive network of industry experts, programs, and assets that help companies solve productivity, commercialization, research and development, and other issues that are challenges to growth. Again, FuseHub is New York State's statewide MEP center. Part of what FUSUB does is to increase the awareness of the expertise and capabilities that are available to companies across New York State. We leverage expertise in-house or through partnerships. We assess company needs and then connect these companies with capable resources and then track and monitor and follow up on the connections. Now, the way that we do this is with a unique mix of technology through things like webinars, of course, but there's also resources, manufacturing expertise, and special events such as our solutions forums, which also help manufacturers. Finally, FUSUB coordinates statewide projects and other strategic initiatives that are guided by New York State to serve the needs of small and medium sized companies. Now, today's presenters on the left, that's me, Steve Melito. I'm a matching specialist for Fuse Hub. We are joined by Bo Keat, who is the president of the Keat Group, and by Brent Waba, who is the president of Strategy Science Incorporated. Welcome. Welcome again, everybody. This is Brent Waba. In addition to thanking Steve, I just want to give a quick shout out to Beth and Paige at Fuse Hub as well as Tom Bell from the CEG. Putting this webinar together has been a big team effort and everyone's help is greatly appreciated. Today we're gonna to talk about a different method for jumpstarting improvement. Bo and I have been coaching improvement for quite a while and over the past 10 years, we've been digging deeper and deeper into why successful transformations both work and stick. We've all seen list after list of why Leaner Sigma fails, but rather than trying to counteract a huge list of negatives, we've learned that it is far more efficient and effective to focus on a critical few positive changes inside an organization. This has led to what we're going to talk about today, leverage points. And one thing you will hopefully feel from this discussion is familiarity. Nothing we will ask you to try is radically different from anything you've probably done before. But what is different, however, is how organizations can discover those small situation specific leverage points that really lead to big gains. Let's begin. During the sign up, we asked you what concerns or struggles have you had with your improvement initiatives? When we analyzed that pain, we ended up with some repeating patterns. The first is change resistance, and this is always one of my favorites. No doubt everybody wants change in their organization, but it is impossible to predetermine exactly how to achieve it. We all know that classes or books on change management don't often work very well for our specific challenges. We also know that if we try to change too many things at one time, 
the resulting complexity confuses our organizations. Thus, one of our goals in developing this method was to understand how much and what kind of change is necessary to improve and sustain overall performance. As it turns out, it's not that much if we do it right. A lot of you want to expand your learning and become better coaches. And we absolutely love to hear this type of thinking because it aligns very well with the social and experimental methods that we're going to talk about later. Participation and sustainability are also interesting topics, and we found that they are both functions of complexity and engagement. Asking too much from an already overburdened organization is a surefire recipe for reducing capacity and preventing participation. So simplicity is key in a change program. Startups have many of their own unique challenges, but just like existing businesses, the critical issues of value creation, priorities, and improving capabilities need to be addressed. Hopefully you will see some concepts today that will help with the hows. There are also some situation specific process issues that we can only address at a very high level today because of time constraints, but we would still love to discuss them further either during the Q&A section or at a later date. And last but not least, money. Who doesn't need to improve their financials? Now that's why you do care, but why else should you care? Those are some specific continuous improvement issues that you are facing. Let's also look at this from a broader prosperity perspective. If our businesses truly succeed, then so do our customers, our suppliers, and each of us individually as employees or investors. And that really is our ultimate objective, joint prosperity. But sadly, less than 10% of business plans actually do succeed. Our finance leaders think it's because we don't have enough management capacity. That's not to say that managers aren't working hard enough, but from a productivity standpoint, our managers just aren't adding enough value for achieving the business plan. The average leader spends less than 25 minutes a day on strategy and planning issues. So when we get behind in our business plans, what do we do? Well, most companies create a big sales push and couple it with an emergency cost reduction plan that have rules like sell whatever you can, nobody can travel, and don't take delivery of your equipment until next quarter. Obviously, they're all, these are all bad because they stress customers and employees, cause tremendous process unevenness throughout our organizations, and shift the focus away from greater, longer-term value creation. To back that up with some data, it's been proven that companies that only focus on money or predominantly focus on money earn less profit than those that focus on people. And by people, we mean our own employees and our customers. We don't focus on our employees and keep them happy, and we don't keep our customers happy. We've got a poor customer experience, and repeat business is predominantly determined by customer experience. Taking that down to profit, if we're not satisfying our customers and they don't have a good experience, they aren't coming back, we quickly deteriorate our profitability. To summarize so far, despite all our knowledge and business sophistication, we still have concerns about both our business performance and our methods of improving that performance. What's wrong with this picture, Bo? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. This is Bo Keat. Well, what we find wrong with this picture is that we tend to rely on our intuition or past experience to fix things. This intuition is coming from how we now think about things. That's the challenge. So Albert would care because he once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And we constantly find this challenge in our economy today. How we think and act may not be good enough, but how do we jump out of the box? It seems that many organizations find it harder to create lasting change than Einstein did in thinking about thoughts on relativity. In fact, I'm wondering in terms of lead time, did it take Einstein less time to solve the theory of relativity than it has for you to fix and align the problems you have inside your organizations? We have powerful paradigms in place, and those paradigms can actually be saturated with some old thinking. So these are the types of solutions that Brent and I have seen, and each one of them have the same endpoint. But they are paradigms, and they could be good paradigms. If they work for you, keep on going.
But if they don't work for you, it could be because we use the same thinking inside those paradigms as we did when we created the problems. In fact, when we go from bullet point to bullet point, we listen to the language of people talking about that. And the language is different. Sometimes it's different inside one of these paradigms. It's like there's a Tower of Babel out there where everyone's always talking about it in a different language. I'm betting that people on this webinar have already tried two or three of these things. That's not a bad thing if it's working for you, but sometimes it doesn't. For instance, in traditional Lean or Six Sigma transformations, we often get great frontline results in a single pilot work stream. But when we try to expand, everything falls apart. Brent and I have seen this live. And when we look at what's happening, we realize that the rest of the organization, not in the pilot, is overburdened. They don't have time for this stuff. And when they were busy working on the pilot people, when they were busy doing their thing, they didn't reach out and try to understand the perspective of the rest of the organization and try to somehow engage in such a way that might be a better solution systemically and include those people in the thinking. So if you're too busy and someone's approaching you with a solution, you tend to push back. I do. And so, do the, so does the rest of your organizations. In addition, management processes and behaviors are parts of larger problems when these things go south. So that's what we've seen. And when we cast an eye to what others have been writing and talking about, we run up against some numbers that are challenging. When I don't know what the right number is, I see all sorts of numbers about the risk of change programs. All I know is it's kind of a dire message. And the story behind this, these numbers include the plates are already full, just like we talked about overburden. And when we get into trying to figure out what we would like to change and how to do it, there's an overwhelming number of experts in books. For instance, if three of us in an organization said, hey, we really need to change things around here, it's just not working. Let's all go out and take a different book, read it and come back and we'll figure out what to do. And we do that and we find out that the books don't agree, but each book has typically, not always, typically prescriptive thinking. And now the prescriptive thinking is in conflict with each other as we look between the books. Some of us get frustrated. We outsource the thinking, we bring in consultants, but then they bring in their prescriptive thinking that doesn't do a very good job adapting to your reality. So we're kind of stuck, excuse me. And what we end up with are solutions piled on top of solutions. In other words, we never sweep the legacies away, we just add on. And what this really capacity is it confuses the organization. And if they're confused, they spend their precious capacity unpacking that salute, uh, that confusion rather, to try to make sense out of it instead of moving forward. They're stuck trying to figure out what the confusion means. Uh, in fact, I was on the phone, I was on the phone about a week and a half ago with a professor. And we were talking about um, industry consolidation and the large amount of resources that people use to affect change, both dollars and people time. And he said that he was considering doing research on whether it made sense to make any changes at all inside a business. Because his hypothesis was, hey, we put all this time and, and effort into change, look at the risk of get, not getting it right and oh, by the way, someone's going to probably buy you in the next year or two. So why bother doing anything? I hung up the phone and the first thing I thought of was that was a very naive perspective on how to run a business. The second thing I thought of was this webinar. And I'm wondering if people online now have some of those thing, same thoughts. And if you do, I would suggest that we are strategically challenged. Uh, Yo has lots of good quotes. He's actually a pretty good thinker, or was. Uh, his quote right here is, we're lost, but we're making good time. What this means to us 
is when Brent and I go in and talk with companies. Everyone's trying to do something good with the best of intentions. They are have lots of activities to make improvements, but there's no progress in moving the needles they need to move. So we're lost because we're scrambling and somehow, somehow organizations equate activity with progress. We might be so lost if we knew there was a direct line between these activities we're employing and where we need to be 12 to 24 months down the road with very specific goals that if we don't get to, we will not be as competitive as, competitive as we need to be in our changing marketplace. So that's the challenge we have to try to get back and understand a good path and then make good time. So I'd like to give it back to Brent to share some of the keys we found in making good time on the right path. Brent? Thanks, Bo. When Bo and I looked back at the hundreds of companies we've worked with, we found that the most successful ones only leveraged a few small, simple changes in some very specific categories. So let me describe them. Strategic alignment was a lot more than giving everyone a copy of the business plan. Business improvement succeeded when companies had a good value producing strategy to begin with and then aligned everyone behind it. Sadly, most organizations don't deeply understand what their customers value, much less how to deliver it efficiently and effectively. Management work and formalized management systems are hot topics these days. We found that successful companies rarely had big, complicated production-like management systems. Now, surprisingly, the opposite of what we expected to see. Measurement systems in the better organizations were more often focused on a few higher level objectives. An organization is a system, and any system can only be optimized for a single output. We cannot maximize a car's fuel economy and acceleration and safety and comfort simultaneously. We always need to prioritize and make trade-offs. So what happens when we throw dozens of metrics into our organizations? Long story short, we confuse everybody, lose focus, and reduce capacity. And behavior. We know that changing behavior takes a lot of time and effort, and just like measurements, our successful organizations only changed a few strategic behaviors at a time. The last insight was that organizational capacity was typically addressed before these organizations tried to change. Instead of overburdening the most challenged part of the company with extra improvement work, these companies found ways to add capacity first. Now, I'm not suggesting that these were the only things these organizations ever changed, but this was predominantly how they got started, as well as what sustained their improvement over time. At this point, you might be thinking, this sounds way too simple and way too good to be true, right? Well, it did for us too. But as we started looking around outside our conventional continuous improvement world, we found example after example of small, simple changes that really made a difference. Richard Thaler, one of the authors of Nudge, won a Nobel Prize last year for behavioral economics. His work is about how small, often imperceptible nudges can have big, big impacts on our unconscious decision-making. Policing, interrogation, and hostage negotiation have changed a lot over the last 30 years moving from getting tougher during arrests and sentencing to building rapport in the community and preventing problems. As a result, crime rates have dropped significantly in most cities. Habitat for Humanity works by getting people to quickly practice desired behaviors rather than trying to convince them to change with a lot of social theory and training. You may have heard of wicked problems, which have a lot in common with our transformation challenges, because in both, we shouldn't be wasting our time trying to find simple cause and effect relationships when they don't actually exist. Captain David Marquette wrote about his experience making the sailors under his command feel valued and part of something bigger, and that enabled a much more efficient and effective system of distributed leadership. Closer to our continuous improvement worlds, Hoshan Connery works by creating alignment behind a few important strategic goals. And finally, Donella Meadows contributed to the science of complex adaptive systems 
by uncovering the types of nodes and connections within a system that can be leveraged to drive maximum change. Not surprisingly, these are called leverage points. And as these examples show, they are unique for each system. So in our improvement context, leverage points are simply small, simple changes that greatly advance our organization's success. Now let's review a few business applications. First is from my own experience running a global systems business at Delphi. We needed to quickly turn around a troubled 2,000 person, multi-hundred million dollar organization. We chose to adopt Lean across the entire enterprise. We knew a lot less about Lean back then, but that actually worked to our advantage in keeping things simple and achieving our operating income objective. We replaced our 27 metric balanced scorecard, which nobody ever followed or even understood, with two overarching business metrics that align with our value proposition. Our lean initiatives directly supported achieving the two metrics. And within each lean initiative, we were able to find leverage points to accelerate our results. For instance, new product development directly supported our growth metric. We had dozens of individual improvements going on within product development. But the one leverage point that really enabled the other improvements was a new management process for assigning and launching design projects. By reducing overburden through limiting the number of simultaneous projects any engineer was working on, we improved our capacity by 25% and got many more projects done. And it only took us a couple of afternoons to create that management process. In 1987, Paul O'Neill was almost fired as the new CEO of Alcoa because he made worker safety their most important strategic initiative. What the Wall Street analysts didn't understand at the time was that in creating that focus, he also advanced employee engagement, communication, collaboration, and problem solving without a big program trying to simultaneously achieve each advancement directly. Within one year, Alcoa had record profits. M&S is one of my favorite lean examples, and I've written about them several times in the lean post. They started their lean journey trying to be just like Toyota, and they failed miserably. It just wasn't them or their culture. When they regrouped to try again, however, they changed their objective to becoming a better company. They formalized their value producing strategy and then focused on their leverage points of blaming the process, not the people, and PDCA. In the end, they achieved a doubling of their capacity, a 95% lead time reduction, in an order of magnitude improvement of first time quality with about 80% less improvement effort than a conventional lean transformation. Now Bo is going to share another really interesting example. Thanks Brent, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we felt obligated to put data on the screen for you because I figured there's enough engineers and geeks out there that they want to chew on some stuff for a while. So here's a good one. I ran across this uh, company last fall when I was presenting a Shingo Institute workshop. This is a temporary staffing agency company. And in 2003, they thought they had a problem. Now, if you look all the way to, to the left, that's 2003 staring at you. The darker green line is 39%. That's the employee turnover in their company. Now, truth be told, 40% turnover is normal for that industry. It's got some issues. So the company looked at that number and said, you know, we have problems with our company and our performance. We're really troubled by this and we think it should be better. So they employed a polling agency to take a look at employee satisfaction. The employee agency came back and with that blue bar on the left said, you know what? Your satisfaction is 71%. That's really good. And their response was, well, it might be really good, but it's not good enough to stem a 40% turnover. We need to do something different. So they thought about it and they decided to change the behaviors around two specific principles, their leverage points. The first was treat everyone with respect. The second was lead with humility. The interesting thing about this is that the person who designed the program was a master black belt and she locked up her black belt or Six Sigma toolkit, stuck it in the corner and it gathered dust 
for 13 years. Last fall, when I saw them, they said that their, turn, their turnover rate was down to 17%, which is a world-class standard no, no one else in the industry is approaching. You also see the blue bars and realize that for six years straight, they've been at 90 points or above in employee satisfaction. What, you, what the last uh, line is, the lighter green line is profit. It has skyrocketed and the only thing they did was focus on behaviors that constantly demonstrated respect for people and leading with humility. I think they took, from my perspective, they stole something out of Alcoa's playbook, that if you take care of people, the people will take care of, of business. So with all these examples in mind, let's get serious about what a good leverage point is because that's what we really wanna talk about. I'd first like to talk about characteristics of good le leverage points. To begin with, man, if it's not lined up to something you need to get to in 12 to 24 months, it's critical for your success, don't go there. It has to be strategically aligned. And universally meaningful basically means if that leverage point can't touch the heart and or head of each employee, there's no pull. There's gotta be a pull for this. Next, it has to be a changeable situation. And here's where you have to invoke Einstein's quote. You have to use new thinking about this. And don't, don't, um, don't shy away from big opportunities. For instance, it might be perfectly reasonable to have a changeable situation be uh, dealing with a, an unprofitable business division. However, it may not be so reasonable or changeable to wrap it around a cranky CEO or foreign parent company. One way or another, each company on this call will have its own parameters about what changeable is. And I encourage you to get some thoughtful people in the room and create those parameters, but keep that quote of Einstein sitting above you. Next, it has to be management led. I've seen 30 years of management endorsement and not a lot of leading. In general, people watch your feet to see if you walk the talk after a new program is announced. We need to find a leverage point that management can embrace and walk the talk with. Once that's done, then the people will be able to sign on or want to sign on and move forward. And finally, it has to be a measurable outcome. It could be qualitative or quantitative and there's a good chance it won't be buried inside your computer. Uh, but one way or another, we need to know if this leverage point works or not, because the whole point is to be able to align you on the right path to get to where you want to be in 12 to 24 months. So if you think about that, in fact, the, um, the example I used at the last slide, the temporary staffing agency only measured employee satisfaction once a year, but they needed to know during the year if all the efforts they were putting in place to respect people and lead with humility, humility were working. So they needed to create surrogate data, surrogate metrics that would guide them through the year until they got that snapshot at the end of the year. So with these characteristics, it's finally time to offer something pragmatic inside this webinar. Um, we need to find good leverage points. And what we've done, what Brent and I have done, is we've created some thoughtful questions that if poised or answered by you, you'd actually be able to think about what that means to your own uh, individual companies. Now, we probably thought of about 16 or 17 questions altogether, but what we decided to do for this webinar is offer up six or seven to share with you to see if your organization might have an appetite for this direction. So the first is, uh, what critical few strategic goals do you have? Once again, these are the things you need to meet in 12 to 24 months to stay competitive. And if you understand what those goals are, you could then challenge the gaps that you have 
on what we should stop doing. So take these questions, find some, um, find a few colleagues, go into a room. Here's your pragmatic piece. Go into a room, shut the door, give yourself an afternoon and use these questions to identify gaps. So I got ahead of myself. So you'll have gaps in what we should stop doing. For instance, we may have to stop an unprofitable service line or product line, or uh, maybe we have a program where we're supposed to be doing problem solving A3s every month, and it doesn't seem to be doing things to affect the strategic goals. So maybe that's something we should stop doing. But if you go back to what Brent said about freeing up capacity first, this is your opportunity to free up capacity to do some lifting with the leverage points. So please put a, uh, some lists, uh, make a list of what things we, we might want to stop doing. And after we're done with that, we go to how do we get there? We're revolving around the work. The work could be daily work, it could be improvement work, or it could be the behaviors we have inside our work. There are gaps. So write the gaps down in terms of what we should be doing versus how we should be getting there. When you're done with that, that question, start thinking about the capabilities. Who will successfully do what means that as you look towards the future, 12 to 24 months, you're gonna have some capabilities you neither either need to add or have more of. What are those gaps and capabilities? Running down to coordination next. Everything we do inside an organization has some sort of priority and is triggered in some manner. What are the gaps you see in how information or material flow through the uh, organization and the work that we do? And finally, regardless of how good the plan is, we always have problems. So how do we measure to see the problems and what do we do once we find them? What's our countermeasure? How do we think about it? How do we get back on track? Um, how do we sustain it? There are gaps now in how we deal with this. So with your colleagues inside that room, make a list. And two or three hours later, when you've completed this discussion, sit back and look at the whole list. And what will start to emerge are uh, affinities, or themes or patterns among these answers. That's where you're gonna find the leverage points. So if you have some thoughts on leverage points, you then open the door, <laughs> go out and share them with people to get their thinking and see whether or not there's an appetite to go further. That's the that's the beginning point and could be the easiest part of it in terms of coordinating it among the organization. However, once you decide to move forward, every person inside that organization may have changes to their work to support the specific leverage points. So Brent's gonna take you through what that looks like from a person to person perspective. Brent? Great, thanks, Bill. So while that process really is that straightforward within a small group, we do still need to engage others outside that first meeting to expand our leverage points across our enterprise. If we don't do that, we will create even more silos. For example, as a business leader, and that's me smiling in the middle of that circle, I can look at each of the five categories and determine which few changes would really improve my own work output from my own perspective. As part of a management team running a business, I need to make sure my own improvements are aligned with both our overall strategy and the changes my teammates and their departments are also pursuing. Otherwise, we would greatly confuse our organization and undermine each other. Now let's turn to the rest of the company. You might recall the term fractal from your junior high science or math classes. As a quick reminder, a fractal is a repeating pattern that looks the same whether you zoom in or zoom out as if a tree's leaves look like little trees themselves. When we think about these five categories, we see that organizations are fractals too. As a manager in the middle of this picture, 
I am concerned about producing value in my job. And so is my boss and her job and my peers and subordinates and customers and all their jobs too. As we zoom out, those interfaces between individuals and groups should just disappear. We should only see that the overall business is concerned about producing enough very well-defined value. And the same goes for addressing the other four colored bubbles that support running a business. Obviously, it is not that smooth for most of us, or else we wouldn't be tuned in here today. We end up with a lot of performance problems inside our organizations because we don't do a very good job of coordinating our strategic, tactical, and improvement activities from individual to individual, or team to team, or level to level. And as a result, when we zoom out to the company level, there is no sharp, bright, stable pattern of performance. It's just fuzzy, dim, and unrepeatable. So how do we get better at getting better? Our high-level strategic ac activities, all the way down to our routine day-to-day -day actions, are greatly affected by unconscious thinking, emotions, and behaviors. No matter how clinical and technical we try to act by documenting every process on value stream maps, organizations are still highly social systems too. This means that if we want to maximize that higher level organizational output, we need deliberate social coordination with one another. And it's around alignment, priorities, communication, and behaviors. And we can achieve that more easily with the way we create and spread our leverage points throughout the fractal. So that's our basic theory, and it's supported with a number of real life examples. Now let's get down to a process that you can drive inside your own organizations. And hey, maybe you, you can even start this later on this afternoon. Like most improvement processes, we all need to start on the same page with some form of scoping or kickoff. Here, we wanna make sure our team is aligned with strategy and value. Now, I don't care if it's leverage points or any other methodology, if an organization doesn't understand the value it produces and its strategy, it really has no business pursuing continuous improvement. Why launch a program if you don't know which direction you need to take it in? Once we get past that, we can then assess the situation and look at symptoms. Here we are really trying to prevent our team from jumping directly to solutions because again, these are complex problems that don't have simple root causes. And thus they can't be solved by saying things like, our problem is we need a new CRM system. And finally, we've got to agree on a starting point and some targets. Our starting point is our best current assessment of where we had the most leverage to solve our chosen problem. And it can be anything really, a division, a process, a product line, or our work in a particular market. The next section, selection, this is what Bo just described. We're gonna get a team together, we're gonna to identify those one to three leverage points. We're gonna confirm the work that we want to stop outside this team, across our fractal. And we're gonna select one or two supporting behaviors that directly align with the leverage point. Again, we can create this laundry list of good behaviors that excellent companies uh, practice, but we want to focus. So here we're just going to pick one or two that are going to align with our leverage points. The next section, socialization and experimentation, these are two things that you probably already know how to do, but unfortunately we don't see them practiced very often in transformations because they just don't lend themselves to prescriptive models. But as we've observed, these are both incredibly important to finding sustainable solutions. And because they are a little bit different, Bo is going to expand on each in the next two slides. Bo? Thanks, Brent. And we see some socialization going on here. I'm hoping that if you, it, it, as you socialize in your fractal, you don't need the name tags you see on the jackets of the people in the picture, that you actually know the names and can recognize them inside your company. However, the first thing we want to agree on as we socialize our initial thinking is within our fractal. We want everyone to agree on the symptoms, problems, and impact, share and agree on leverage points in the plan, and even supportive behavior. So first our fractal, and then we move out to the whole organization to make sure not only are we aligned, but other people are engaged so we hear their views too. Socialization, to me, is so sorely lacking in our technical transformations today. And the more we socialize, the better. And when I look at that fractal, what I really see are interfaces that need discussion. 
As we have discussions with people around the fractal through socialization, we basically break down the silos because we're constantly checking to see if what we're doing hurts anybody else and moves the overall company forward. And if we all do that, all of a sudden the silos tended to be diminished and we seem to be on the right path, making good time, just like Yogi wants. So we use the socialization method just well beyond this through an entire, entire transformation and as a cornerstone of the leverage points process. Now, in terms of the experiment, um, I was really happy when Brent found this picture because it took me back to when I was their age and I was sitting at my kitchen table with a chemistry set. And I was reading stuff to make and I had no idea how to actually make this stuff. So I get out my test tubes and put some stuff together and I made something and every once in a while I got it right. Uh, but when you project from there into the science labs of high school, one thing I remember is everybody was having fun. They enjoyed the ability to go into something not knowing how it was gonna come out, but trying to learn something new and get a very specific thing made or thing understood or thing learned. And that's what we see now with our clients. We run them through, we have them <laughs> designed to run themselves through experiments and they are happy they're having fun because it's very different iterating yourself to a new place than just taking what looks good on paper for the future state and implementing it, assuming it will work when it never does. So our, our team start with something that looks good on paper and they know it's not gonna work the first time. And they also know how to iterate again and again and learn from failure until they get the goal they want. This, once again, is sorely lacking in most transformations, this type of thinking. And what we end up uh, with in terms of results it are better and deeper results because they've been able to learn what to do and what not to do as they move forward. So think of your fractal and think of how to experiment within your fractal and realize that over the past half hour, what we've actually done is challenged current thinking, challenged how to think differently, talked a little bit about simplifying uh, what you want to do um, and how to think about leverage points and how to think about some of the foundational things that are really important, such as socialization and experimentation. And now it's time to consider if this is right for you. Brent? Okay, thanks, Paul. As we mentioned earlier, the real mm -hmm. success, success rate of common change methodologies or just blindly copying other solutions is pretty low. If your organization is truly succeeding with its current change methodology, then please just keep going. You do not need a big disruption. Bo and I have both dedicated our lives to Lean and Sigma. And we know how great they can be when the stars do all align. But if, however, you are not achieving strategic results, you're not increasing your capacity, you're finding that behaviors in your organization are undermining your improvement objectives, or you're finding that your methodology is just not clicking with the culture that you have, then leverage points can give you an opportunity for a quick, low-risk reset, or sometimes we say intervention. And I want to emphasize the low-risk part of this. You aren't starting by abandoning your strategy, creating an army of improvement coaches, or signing an expensive multi-year consulting contract. You're just sitting down with your teammates for a morning or afternoon, uncovering some opportunities, and seeing where it takes you. The only qualifiers are, first, that you have to be willing to try some simple, fast, cheap experiments. You're not betting the farm, you're just gonna run an experiment, and if it doesn't work, so be it. Second thing is, you've gotta be willing to create your own unique path. This isn't a process to take you from where you are to Toyota in five steps instead of 10 steps. This is a process to take you to where you could be as your own unique organization. So in summary, we started today talking about familiarity. Hopefully nothing here was radically new, with the caveat that we think you should be doing much less improvement work. You can accomplish that by becoming much more deliberate about what you do focus on. 
Leverage points is a proven method to get you there. From our experience, we've seen this approach result in more strategic, faster, easier transformation, while indirectly, but still very effectively addressing your concerns of change resistance, coaching, participation, sustainability, and of course, money. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve, and we're gonna find out what questions you have. Steve? That was outstanding. Thank you so much, Bo and Brent. We are now going to enter the Q&A portion of our webinar. In our first question, Bo, I'd like to go to you on this one. That question is, how do I get started? Um, well, I'm hoping that anyone who might be interested uh, can get started by going back to the slide that I covered, the pragmatic approach of getting in a room and uh, with some colleagues and thinking through uh, what gaps you have in terms of the value, the work, et cetera. And that would at least give you a head start in seeing, as you socialize that, would give you a head start to see if anyone else has an appetite. If there is an appetite, then you want to go a step further. So you have some options. Uh, you can, you can uh, go out on your own and do your best to go down this road and, and uh, see what happens. You can also engage us. We're, we're giving this webinar because we actually want to work with folks. Um, and we can either spend a couple of days with you sharpening up your uh, leverage points or be engaged in a longer term with you. It all depends on what your needs are and what your resources are. Very good. And Brent, can we have you answer that same question? And it's, how do I get started? Steve, um, just to, to build on what Bo was saying, Again, there's, there's a lot of things that you can try on your own. If you have some specific questions, please reach out through Fuse Hub. They'll get in touch with us and we'll get back with you. Um, or if you do need help, right, there are lots of options from we can teach you within a day what the whole process is. We've had to cut a few corners here today just because of timing constraints. We can teach you and facilitate or we can teach, facilitate, and coach. So there are really a lot of options. The point being is, this is not a methodology where we try to set up shop inside your company, right? This is something that you should be able to long-term take over and should be able to take over yourself and just keep driving over and over and over. Excellent. And Bo, let's go back to you. There's another question that came in, and that question is, is this just a top-down process? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, there is a need for the top. The top needs to decide what's important. What's, there's probably lots of programs going on inside your company. I'm not convinced that all are important to meet uh, the needs of the next two years. So if the top could actually figure out the two or three things that are important and, and socialize that, then it can start anywhere. That fractal can be any pinpoint anywhere. It could be a manager, it could be a director, and it doesn't have to be top down. Very good. And Brent, what are your thoughts on this? Is this just a top down process? Definitely not. We essentially did this at Delphi, and we started in the middle of our organization. We had goals from the top of our organization that we had to achieve, but quite honestly, our bosses didn't know how to fix the problems that we had. So we took it upon ourselves to find our leverage points and to, to uh, refine our strategy. And then as part of our socialization process, we pushed it back up to make sure that our bosses were in agreement. And it turns out not only were they in agreement, but I think they were a little bit relieved that we had a strategy going forward and a way to address this because they weren't sure what to do. Good. And Brent, with that answer, let's stick with you for this next question to start with. And that question is, does everything revolve around a manager in the fractal? Ah, that, that is a great question. We say manager in the middle of these fractals, but it's got a different meaning. Everybody has some form of management work, whether it's the CEO or somebody on the board of directors, all the way down to somebody working the production line. You are managing some element of your work. So if you are trying to find the leverage points around some process or some particular problem, there is a, a critical person in the middle of the fractal that we call the manager, but it really can be anyone inside the organization that, that's going to lead this process. Very good, and Bo, what are your thoughts on this one? Does everything revolve around a manager in the fractal? 
I, I agree with, I don't have a whole lot to add from Brent. It's just been my, my own experience that every worker has something to manage and some have more management work than others. So it, so uh, it's kind of no and yes. No, it doesn't revolve around a manager, but yes, it does uh, revolve around the work we manage. Very good. Well, let's sort of work on that one some more. What was your most surprising outcome? Mm. I had a recent outcome that was surprising. Uh, this was with an insurance company and they had field offices. They had just been through a, um, a big software change in the field. A new program came in and the way it was deployed is the people at corporate drew up all the work instructions on exactly how to do everything down to the keystrokes and push it out to the field and it wasn't working very well. In fact, it was working very poorly. So they kind of hit the reset button and uh, they brought me in. I was working with the field and at first they started getting excited about making changes, but all of a sudden corporate kind of said, well, you know, you should be doing what we tell you. And there was kind of a big fracas and then out, it just emerged out of nowhere. Corporate finally figured out that their leverage point was don't tell the field what to do. And they repeated that mantra. When they stopped telling the field what to do, the performance took off. It, it was just remarkable. And they, the field went from last in place in terms of employee satisfaction to first in place in one year. Good stuff. And Brent, let's ask you that question as well. What was your most surprising outcome? The one that really comes to mind was some work I did with a large IT organization. We had about 1,600 people, and we were engaged by their executive or leadership team to improve their productivity. They just weren't completing their IT projects on time, quality was poor, and management was convinced that the issue was that within their organization, the different departments just weren't stepping up. So what they wanted was a conventional value stream improvement program. Um, and we went through that process and they, they came up with some, some good things, so no doubt, some good improvements based on value stream mapping. But the things that really jumped out were their leverage points. And as it turns out, there were two. The first was an individual. There was one guy and he had very specific knowledge and as a result, everybody needed this guy on their project teams. So he was a bottleneck for nearly every project they had going through their organization. Second thing that came out is that in going through the analysis, we found that the people that hired us were actually the problem and they turned out to be the leverage point. What they were doing is, you know, when a project wasn't getting done and somebody would, would call them up on the phone, they'd shuffle around resources and pull from one project and put on another. And they were doing this constantly, day to day. And they were overburdening their organization and really reducing the flow of each project. So their leverage point became what is the process to prioritize projects and to make sure that they aren't pulling resources so that projects could get done more quickly, customers would be satisfied, and they didn't have all this churn and the extra work that's associated with all that churn. Excellent, excellent. We've got lots of questions here. Another one that came in. Uh, Bo, let's go to you on this one. How should we initially address the relationship with existing key performance indicators, including active continuous improvement initiatives? Uh, that's a great question, and I and uh, so I'm a consultant. So my first answer is it depends. But that being said, I would go back to the questions surrounding value uh, on on those uh, five bubbles, and whatever you're doing. I'm sorry, it was um, oh the performance indicators and the CI initiatives, right? Yes. Okay. So whatever you're doing, if you go down through those bubbles, the first one is value. And if you're doing, if you understand the two or three things you should be aimed at, 
uh, the CI folks are usually pretty helpful, but you may be having some programs that don't fit inside some efforts that don't fit inside on that path anymore, that they might be good, but they aren't appropriate. So if you look at that and say, well, what should we stop? You might find some efforts you need to stop or postpone. That being said, the resources of the CI folks are great. So how do we help them or have them help us go in the right direction? So that's the first thing about the, the, uh, value, the value proposition and how CI might impact that. In terms of the measurements, if you go back to what Brent was talking about in, in his Delphi experience, when we went from, I think it was 25 or 27 measurements to two, um, something similar is probably gonna happen with your KPIs. And I would probably use a discussion around, once again, the value proposition to see which of those KPIs actually help us get there and which are more distracted than others. And anyway, th those are my thoughts. Brent, what would you add? I just want to add, there's nothing wrong with having linked or cascading metrics in an organization. Uh, obviously not everything you measure is going to be related to growth or profit or something that high level, but there's got to be a connection between what you are improving or what you are working on day to day and those higher level things. So if you've got a number of things that you're measuring in your continuous improvement activities, you can kind of do a, a reverse Hoshan Conry and see, do these all somehow link and add up to the higher level strategic value related things that Bo just talked about? And in doing that, you'll find out if you have some gaps. And if you're measuring a bunch of things that people can't change or are never going to change or aren't going to work on, well, that's a, that's a clear waste right now, something that you can, you can end. And um, my guess is nobody would ever notice. Very good. So, Bo and Brent, we have many more questions, more questions than we have time to get through in the hour that we've told folks we're going to be here. My understanding is that you'll take some additional questions after we run through the rest of the webinar. So, let me tell you all a bit about how you can find this afterwards. In, the, in fact, this will answer some of the questions that have come in. You can find this presentation recording online tomorrow at fusehub.com slash webinar dash continuous improvement. Again, this will be available tomorrow. And then finally, we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you about how to get more assistance from FuseHub on the many challenges that small to medium manufacturers face. Anytime, day or night, 24 seven, you can visit the FuseHub website, look for the solutions portal link. It's near the phone number in the top and choose that link and then complete the request. If part of your request is to talk to either Bo or Brent, please let us know in that. If your request is about something else, please let us know that too. Finally, if you'd like to keep the conversation going, if you'd like to continue to engage FuseHub or hopefully even some of the other folks that were on the line here with you today, you can find FuseHub on LinkedIn, Twitter, Google, or Facebook. You'll see our social media links over on the right. And finally, you can always email us at info at FuseHub.com. Again, we'd like to thank everyone who has been with us for this hour, for this webinar, especially thanks to Bo and Brent. They've done an outstanding job. And we're gonna sign off here, but we're gonna continue with the Q&A. All right, the next question, Bo and Brent here with the Q&A. Uh, Brent, let's start with you. What is a good way to persuade upper management to get the frontline managers to buy in? I am going to answer that question with respect to what we just talked about today. I, I realize that's a broader question about continuous improvement in general, but it really gets down to socialization. If our team at our level can identify a critical problem, we tie it to the strategy that our higher level executives really care about because that's their day-to-day -day job, uh, we can make proposals, say, here's what we've found, here are what we think our leverage points are. Do you agree with this? It aligns with these metrics. We only want to change a few things. 
explain it and then ask them what they think, right? Don't say, is this okay? Because they're gonna say either sure or, don't, or no, but engage them a bit saying, okay, here's what we think. What do you think? Is this something we can move forward with? And from my own personal experience, it's usually that simple. Um, both my work at Delphi, and I know that uh, when Bo and I work with clients, we run into this a lot. Well, you know, we can't do this, no one's gonna let us do that, our bosses are all stupid and whatever. Uh, bring it forward, bring it forward professionally, and the uh, vast majority of the time, you will get the blessing because again, they don't know how to solve your problem. So if you come to them with at least a path towards a solution, they're gonna appreciate it and support it. Sure, sure. Bo, is there anything you would add here? The question again is, what's a good way to persuade upper management to get the frontline managers to buy in? I, I, I like Brent's uh, response. However, I would add one thing. If you think about uh, the management-led characteristic, um, whatever is proposed to me needs to be um, a leverage point that the management can actually demonstrate. And my personal experience has been when the management walks a talk, everybody is watching, including the middle managers. And so that can be an enabler also. Good, good. Well, let's stick with you for the next one that's come in. What concepts are picked up most easily and which ones are most challenging for the companies that you've worked with? Well, I'll be blunt. <laughs> what everyone likes is tools. Sure. They, like the they, they like the technical part of change. What's hardest for them to do is figure out how to socialize. And it's different for every company. And we actually treat socialization as an experiment because people don't know how to do it right, right away. So they have to iterate and figure out what's best for their company. So that, I, I, I guess that's a quick answer. My biggest challenge, are, I, I, at least in my experience, the biggest challenge has been the socialization and the experiment to allow people to fail. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Good, and Brent, have you seen the same thing? Uh, if, if not, again, the question is, what concepts are picked up most easily? Which ones are the most challenging? Yeah, I agree with Bo that socialization is is uh, not always easy at first for a lot of people, uh, especially in technical organizations. Uh, but the one that that I think gains the most acceleration is the experimentation part. We are all born with the scientific method wired into our brains. That's how we learn. It's only when we start going to school that it gets beaten out of us because we're told to remember lists of presidents and states and spelling and all this other stuff. It's still there. We just need to, to dust it off and, and bring it back out again. So once we get over that hump and say, you already know how to do it. This is not, you know, this isn't rocket science. Uh, you've done this before. Get people going on it. It's like Habitat for Humanity. Get people going on exhibiting that behavior. They pick it up very quickly, and as Bo mentioned, this is really the fun part. This is when we see the most engagement. Good. There's been a couple of questions about socialization that have come in. I think we can condense them into this one. And Bo, you also talked about this. Um, how much socializing goes into adding or addressing the organizational capacity? How long is this going to take? How much effort is involved? I'm I'm uh, I'm not sure I'm clear of the question. What do you mean by organizational capacity? So in so what I'm interpreting from the question is part of what they want to do is add organizational capacity. Yes. And they want to know how much socializing they're going to have to do to get from point A to point B. In order to create, in order to socialize about creating capacity. Yes. Oh. I have no idea. I'm, I'm not sure what you're faced with. Uh, but I, so, wow. Um, so it sounds like it's going to depend on yeah, the, so, the yeah, so, 
Yeah, so I, I guess my response is, I, I don't know the context that I can't give you a good answer for you, but I do have a path and the path is start. Figure out who you need to talk to, what you need to say, and how you're going to say it for your fractal. And if you look at your fractal, you have bosses, customers, peers, and subordinates, and start talking with data about what capacity, how you're using your capacity now, and how you'd like to find, I don't know, 15, 20% more capacity to make improvements. And uh, so I get the data first and worry about the message and how to message it to the, to the different parts of the fractal, knowing that the messaging will be a little different depending on whether you're talking to your subordinates or your boss or your peers or your customers. So is there an optimum group size, Bo, to really talk to during that first go around? Or again, is that one of these that depends? If if you want organization-wide capacity, you've got to talk to the organization. If you, you've got to socialize throughout the organization. If you're looking for capacity within a department or a division, you've got to talk to the division or the department. I mean, you, you've got to be able to get out there and, re, and use that opportunity to gather their thoughts too, because they have different realities than you. And until you uncover those, it's not going to be a, a really great uh, uh, discussion. Okay, very good. And Brent, I'd like to get you add to that. Uh, I just want to expand on on Bo's response of it depends. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, back in back in my Delphi days, right, there were things we wanted to eliminate, and some of them were really straightforward to get buy into, and that was things like we need to improve our quotation response time. And if we eliminate these things that nobody really cares about, we can take this much lead time out of it. All our customers are going to be happy, right? The key was, here's what we want to do, and here's why it's good from a low-level and high-level st strategic standpoint to get results. The more difficult elimination things were somebody wanted us to put a new manufacturing plant in another continent. That was a bit of a challenge. There was a product line that we were spending a lot of resources on. It wasn't making any money, and it was preventing us from doing some other things, right? That took a lot of socialization to be able to get all the different parties that are engaged in that part of the business to agree that, yes, it really was in our overall best interest to eliminate this product line. But we did it, and we did it because we could we could show here are the ramifications of doing it both good and bad and make it you know lay it out as a good scientific decision uh, my guess is that you probably don't need to go that far there's so much that we do today to day in reviews and filling out forms and and you know it can even be i know bo has i have we've been in organizations where everybody's required to do a problem solving a3 every month when we talk to those organizations about what do you want to eliminate, that's like the first thing they, they want to get rid of because it takes a lot of time and it's just a big churn. So there are probably some simple things that almost every organization can do, gives them 20, 25% capacity without too much angst. Very good. So a couple other questions that have come in are ones um, that, again, we've answered earlier that you can find this presentation online. You can also find the slides online as well. There's great interest in the slides, and that's going to be at deucehub.com slash webinar dash continuous improvement. And the slides in the presentation itself will be available online tomorrow. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up right here. We would like to thank everyone who has spent some time with us today. Again, our webinar title was Jumpstart Continuous Improvement in Your Manufacturing Business. We hope you've enjoyed the webinar. And for additional assistance, we invite you to contact FUSA. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes, and here too. Thanks, thanks a lot. Appreciate it.